Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Chris Hagler, and I am one of the leaders of the ESG practice at EY. Um, we have about 1,500 people globally that all we do is focus on ESG issues, um, on opportunities, risks, uh, creating strategies, and, and in particular, we do a lot of work around understanding metrics and how companies can best share their story and measure the progress that, that they are making on whatever ESG issues they are uh, focused on. I work primarily with management teams. So my job is usually to work with a cross-functional group of people. Um, when we're talking about diversity, inclusion, and social justice, usually there's somebody from the sustainability or the ESG group as well as uh, people from the diversity and inclusion group. Um, and very often we're also working with people responsible for disclosures um, in the, the finance department or, or that. So that's my role. Cheatham also works with, with us here at EY. She has a completely different role though. So we thought it would be fun to have uh, two different perspectives as we talk about these important issues today. Cheatham, can you talk about your role? Absolutely. Hi, everybody. Really happy to be joining Chris. Um, as she mentioned, I'm Cheatham Octum. I should also note my neighbor, who never, ever, ever makes noise, 30 seconds ago started some massive drilling project. So I apologize in advance. <laughs> I mean, it never fails, right? That's one thing we've learned. Um, well, my my role is a bit different than Chris's, as she mentioned. I serve as EY's regional leader for the Center for Board Matters. And in my role, I work closely with boards and CEOs. So I work directly with them uh, to bring them insights on emerging governance issues and to give a bit more context to what that means. Uh, most of my time is spent in conversation with corporate directors, so whether presenting on specific topics during formal board and committee sessions or designing and facilitating panels at multi-company director events or onboarding new directors or being a thought partner to individual directors. That's really where I spend my time um, in addition to overseeing some of our research as well. Uh, prior to joining EY for several years, I ran an education program for audit committee chairs of Fortune 500 companies. So I've been working with boards long enough to see some really interesting changes that have taken place and are underway. And we'll talk about, about a few of those today with Chris. So thanks, Chris, for letting me introduce myself. Awesome. And, and guys, I'll tell you, I, I rely on, on Cheatham all the time um, in terms of working with management. It's really important to understand what are boards asking for and what are they going to be expecting. And so it's really um, fantastic to have this perspective. Um, so our approach for today is uh, we, we have sort of three buckets of, of information we want to share with you. Um, we hope that you will ask questions in the chat. I think it's a little hard to ask questions any other place for now. Um, but if you get asked questions in the chat, feel free to do it along the way. We're also going to save some time at the end after we go through this. So um, please feel free to keep it as interactive as possible. Um, our, our approach today is to give you a little bit of background, what we're seeing in the marketplace, and then go specifically to, so that's sort of a bigger picture, then talk specifically about what we're seeing boards ask for, what we think they expect of the management team, and then we'll come back and say, okay, well, if this is what boards are expecting of the management team, how are management teams reacting, and then how are they creating metrics to be able to demonstrate the progress? So that's our approach, sort of background, board expectations and management response. So with that, I'm gonna just flip through a couple of slides here to give you some background. You know, first of all, starting with that, this idea of diversity and inclusion is nothing new to organizations. They have absolutely been measuring this for years, been focusing on it for years, you know, and, and I know you've seen some of these statistics, you know, 87% of the organizations with 
high DNI report that they have better decision makers, that they have people who are able two times more likely to exceed expectations. Um, they specifically identify that they can have improved market share when they have a successful, diverse, inclusive culture and, and people in their organization. And the even more interesting, 70% more likely to have success in a new market. I really like that one today, too, because I kind of feel like everything feels like a new market right now. After 2020, it's just like, all bets are off and everything's new. So, you know, the, the idea that a diverse workforce, um, is, you know, really contributes to more success in the new market, I think is super exciting. So to me, that just these stats alone should be enough. Um, but it, it hasn't been because companies have known this for a long time and there hasn't been enough progress um, that, the other thing that's interesting, this uh, the, the data on the right is actually from our own EY uh, research. So we survey our own employees every two years and we ask them about engagement, inclusiveness um, and other things. And we found within our own population, our employees that um, that are of diverse uh, nature and um, feel like they are included in our organization, have 7% higher retention, the people, the groups that they work with have higher revenue growth and higher gross margin. So really from a business perspective, I think it's, it should be clear, but then we're seeing it in the streets every day. Um, Cheatham and I are both based in Atlanta, but you're seeing it across the country um, where these issues that companies think they have been dealing with for years somehow isn't doing enough because there's still significant inequities in the marketplace. There are still significant systemic challenges for people of color um, and companies are more and more expected to take a stand as that weight, racial wealth gap um, divide continues with both Black people and Latinx families, individuals, and communities. So companies, the business case is already there. They've been working on it. It's still not good enough, not making enough of a difference to really drive change. And then we also see, interestingly enough, investors are figuring this out. It's not surprising that it's State Street. Of course, State Street is uh, famous for uh, their, their, their little girl, the statue of the defiant girl um, on, on Wall Street, focusing on gender diversity. Um, but they specifically came out in August and said they expect organizations in their investment portfolio to do a significantly better job articulating what role diversity plays in their human capital practices. What goals do they have around diversity and how do those goals contribute to their overall strategy and how are they managing them? Then they are specifically asking for measures of diversity at the board level and at the employee level. And they're talking about race, ethnicity, gender by the different levels. So they're not just, you know, saying, you know, just tell me, you know, make sure you have at least one diverse board member. Um, but they're really looking at a, a much broader definition of the metrics that they're looking for. They also expect the board itself to be diverse and have a good understanding of what these issues mean. So, and, and if, you're, if you're on this call, you probably have been working in the ESG space. We have absolutely been seeing that, they, that, that investors expect boards to be smart on these issues 
to not to to know what the metrics mean and to understand whether or not the strategy is strong enough to make a difference and then to provide oversight. So this is just what we're seeing from one investor, State Street. And in addition, and, and so companies are responding, right? So it's not just State Street, of course, it's also Larry Fink with his you know, letters from BlackRock and things, but companies really are responding. So first of all, we see them upping their game as it relates to diversity and inclusion. So on their own, internal processes. We see all mo so many organizations rethinking, are we really doing enough? Are we sure that we have definitely come to a place where um, we are not accidentally doing something or that we've looked at all our processes? And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But we've also seen um, in, in this case here on, on the right, I can, he, it doesn't do me any good to point to my slides, right? Does it? Um, but companies making huge commitments. And in this example here, 58 companies have pledged more than $3.3 billion towards social justice organizations and issues. Bank of America, a billion. City, 1.15 billion. I do love how the big banks all outdo themselves. So I think we should see JP Morgan Chase, right, coming in one bigger than what City did <laughs> so they can continue to one up each other, which but I love that, right? Um, and then we even we see organizations even like the the self Hello? Yeah. Hey, Chris, what happened there? All of a sudden you disappeared. Did I disappear? Yep. Okay. Am, am I back? Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, you are. Um, so you were talking about uh, the big banks kind of coming in and starting to weigh in. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. And then, this, and then this the gives other. This me an opportunity to make my, my smart, smart Alec remark about um, <laughs> Jamie Dimon being a competitive person. Yeah, absolutely. That's why I want to see that number, a bigger number, right? Coming out of JP Morgan Chase. So. <laughs> oh God, Chris, so, I figured out what happened. Sorry. I'm going to go ahead and fess up here. Apparently there's a button where I can take you out of the stream. I think I accidentally clicked on that. So I'm sorry. You, you're, you're the one that <laughs> muted me. <laughs> why, why would anybody give me that power? I don't know. Sorry <laughs> about that. I'm not touching anything. <laughs> Luke, take it away from her. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Well, so so but what I think is exciting is that it's not just the big banks that are making big investments, right? Although you do see huge sums of money like Bank of America's two billion dollar equality progress bond or the Celtics, even the Celtics, the basketball team, right, committing $25 million to racial justice. So it's really great to see all these organizations responding. And it's a darn good thing because the regulators are going to expect them <laughs> to do something about it and to report. So if you haven't seen it yet, the SEC did come out with a new rule just a couple of weeks ago. Well, they came out with it for a while and then they had their um, the, the discussion period that they always do, but it has been accepted. And they require registrants to disclose their human capital resources if they're material. So I find it hard to believe that any organization is gonna say that human capital is not material um, and if so, I know I don't want to work there. 
Um, but clearly they're, they're giving, they're leaving it principles based and they're not telling you specifically what to report, but they do expect you to do an assessment, understand how diversity inclusion are material for your organization, and then to disclose that um, and how you are managing it. Okay, so there's where we are. We said, we know it's a big deal. It's gotten even bigger this year with external pressures. Companies are responding. Investors are requiring it. The SEC wants more information. So let's talk about, um, and Art, I see your email and I will give you some of those. Um, let's talk about what the boards are asking for right now. I'm hoping that Chris is going to be more generous than I was and not boot me off the call <laughs> as we're going along. I don't know how. <laughs> um, all right, Chris, we're going to get into the, the metrics. Chris will dive into some of those um, as we go along. But let, let's just first spend a couple moments getting a sense of the, the board's perspective here. So the way that we're, um, we wanted to position this was give you a sense uh, of what's happening, the kinds of discussions that are happening within the boardroom, and then we'll shift and talk about how boards are changing their expectations of management. Um, one quick thing to on that SEC rule that, that came out that Chris mentioned, it's worth noting, typically we think of changes um, and requirements like this one really sort of ultimately driving change. But in this case, uh, the SEC is really moving along with investors. As Chris referenced earlier, investors are really uh, pushing hard in terms of their agenda, uh, the agenda around ESG, including diversity and inclusion. So let me build a little bit on what Chris has talked about to this point. Um, there's a lot of, let me state outright here that there's a lot of variation that is taking place among boards in terms of their level of engagement, where they are on this. I don't want us to be all assuming that everybody's in the same place. They're not. You know, this is a journey for boards and no two boards are going to be alike. Uh, for example, until recently, um, any time the topic of culture or talent or diversity came up, uh, most directors would say, well, our job is to hire the CEO. It's the CEO's job to oversee talent and um, human capital and uh, DNI and take care of all that other stuff. Well, that's changed a lot in the last six months, but it's still a journey. Um, Chris, I'm getting some feedback. Are you hearing it too? Or are you hearing me okay? I okay, hear you then. just fine. All right. Uh, I can go on mute. Okay. Uh, oh, there we go. Thank you. That helps. That helps. I didn't know if it was the voices in my head or if there was uh, true feedback going on there. So what's happened is in the last six months, there really has been a big shift. I mean, because I facilitated a conversation back in December with a room full of directors and that exact question of, well, is it really how does the board engage came up and and the answer from 75 percent of those around the table was very much well that's the ceo's job and we hire the ceo well fast forward to now and that conversation looks very different and i think that's that's noteworthy because that's a real change and that's a rapid change and boards don't usually shift that quickly uh the other thing too is uh at our Center for Board Matters, of course, we do a fair amount of research. We did a risk-based survey of directors and CEOs, and this was um, at the end of last year. The top item, so when we asked about top risks to the business, the top item on the CEO agenda uh, was the risk, the talent risk. So that was the one that they were most concerned about. Uh, but directors actually placed that at number four. It wasn't a big gap in terms of percentages. They all saw this as an important risk, but it was interesting that, you know, CEOs put it at number one and directors uh, put it at number four. I suspect if we were to do that survey today, that gap would be, um, would be closing and you'd see something much more similar. There's also the reality that boards are frankly being uh, directors are grappling with what's being asked of them because typically 
They have not in the past gotten this far deep into the operations of a company since their role is oversight. So they're really trying to figure out what does this mean? How does this, um, what should they be doing? So for example, on the SEC change, you know, you would think it would be pretty straightforward in some ways. Well, we've gotten a slew of calls from directors who are reaching out saying, well, what does this mean for us from a board perspective? How should we be thinking about it, right? Because the, the definitions are so broad uh, and materiality is, of course, one critical criteria, but it's, it's, it doesn't define everything. The other thing that's happened is the recent proxy season in 2020. So that wrapped up sort of around the end of May with the last remaining meetings that were left. Very eye-opening for a lot of directors because investors, you know, think about what happened this year. Um, ESG was very much top of mind for boards. Then COVID hit, sort of we all paused, the world went sideways, and directors thought that, you know, other issues would be rising to the fore. And then uh, Black Lives Matter hit and social justice movement, as Chris alluded to earlier, really brought awareness in a way that's different from, uh, you know, past discussions around this. And so the proxy season where these issues were brought up by investors, again, really brought a focus to directors, uh, particularly around DNI. And there are some takeaways we've been sharing with directors uh, from the proxy season. Uh, so what we've shared is that directors really need to understand that how a company treats its employees in the wake of COVID could affect the brand value for years to come. And of course, that also means if you're losing all your uh, women and minority employees, that's going to be a problem. Um, be prepared for heightened scrutiny of commitments to DNI. You know, Chris, you just laid out a lot of investment that's being made. There are a lot of public statements that have been made by CEOs, and investors have already signaled that they're going to be tracking those and following up. And then um, the other piece here that we've we've observed as a takeaway is uh, it's important to provide data to demonstrate progress and accountability around stated commitments and really also describe the allocation of board level oversight responsibilities. Now on the slide here, we've we've listed some of the areas that boards are considering or they're acting on. I won't go through all of these. We've, we've touched on these through the conversation, uh, but a couple of these I wanna draw your attention to. If you kind of go down to the fourth bullet point there, creating accountability by having DNI measurements included in the CEO compensation. This is a big area of debate. Uh, right now at the last telling, um, 78 out of 3000 companies have pay linkages for their CEO to specific DNI metrics. So this is this is a uh, not something that's mainstream at all. And interestingly though, a more recent survey showed that more than half of directors said that DNI should be part of an of the CEO's incentive plan. Now, I'll emphasize recent because I promise you if this had been, you know, back in December when we were having those other conversations, uh, that wasn't part of the conversation. Chris, did you want to did you want to share something? Yeah. Well, no, I was just going to ask you that. So, I mean, this is literally between December and say what J July or August that it's changed. Yeah, that July, much? I think, is when the survey was. Yep. Now, Crazy. I should also say, I didn't see previous surveys that kind of got to that level of asking the question. So it it could have been that more directors sort of vaguely thought about it, but let's think about that reality. Again, a very small percentage, although some big names like Microsoft do incorporate DNI metrics into CEO compensation, but the typical argument has been, well, wait a minute, the CEO is rewarded for long-term performance of the company and the growth of the bottom line. If diversity is important to company growth, the CEO is gonna address it and that'll be automatically sort of baked in. And there's now the recognition that, you know, that isn't playing out the way that a lot of people had assumed. Therefore, how do we make this more explicit and more concrete? Now, I won't get into compensation details because that's, that's a whole other level, but there are, um, different ways that you can build things into CEO compensation and the compensation consultants now are thinking about what do they do, how do they do it, uh, and thinking through some of this because there's sort of the discretionary part of their compensation where it's up to the board's discretion, which can be based on some specific metrics, and then there's how the share uh, price performs. 
But again, the whole, the bigger point here is DNI metrics are now getting included in the conversation in ways that they never were before. Yeah, hey, um, I, I don't remember if I told you this. Um, I'm working with a client right now that um, EY provides assurance over a lot of their ESG metrics, and they've recently just added all their DNI metrics into the um, in, into the scope of the work because they plan on um, incenting all of their division heads on the DNI metrics. And of course, so they want to make sure they're really good, right, before they put it into compensation, which is why they hired us. But um, just, and this is a Fortune, probably Fortune 100 consumer products company. So. Well, and when you mentioned that, I was really impressed by that, Chris, because again, it's unusual. I expect, you know, we see various trends kind of come and go through the boardroom and create shifts and changes. This uh, ESG and DNI has has come in a rapid pace that's really even outpaced cyber risk oversight, which is sort mm -hmm. of a, an analogy here, and it's interesting. Um, let me run through a couple more quick things here on this slide. Um, the other piece of it too, one of the best ways that boards can ensure focus on something is to make sure that that topic is integrated into overall conversations about strategy and the business. So directors will say specifically, well, if it's important, whenever we're talking about growth, whenever we're talking about markets, whenever we're talking about our talent pool, the board needs to start asking questions around DNI. And so that's a great way that they signal. So they're having that conversation among themselves as they're as they're going through this. Uh, and then the last two here, board composition, you alluded to that, Chris, uh, board composition and oversight allocation. Board composition right now, we talk to a lot of recruiters, so those who do recruiting for board roles, and they have said that the number one kind of criteria that they're now being asked to focus on, of course, you have to have the core competencies and those kinds of things, but the number one request that they're getting is for diverse candidates. Uh, because that's something that most boards will go to their own Rolodexes when they're trying to bring in new board members. But of course, most of us hang out with people that look like us. And so when they're starting to reach beyond their own Rolodexes, they're bringing in recruiters. And they're also signaling to recruiters that they're willing to shift some of the criteria, right? It's not that everybody coming in now has to be a CEO. If you're a divisional CEO and you're a minority candidate, you're going to get a hearing in a way or or truly evaluate in a way that's different than in the past. So that's um, that's important. Then the governance committee typically uh, tends to get involved with oversight of these kinds of metrics and overseeing DNI and talent issues. Uh, so that's that's typically where we'll see these conversations go. Chris, if we jump to the next slide, I know folks are, are really wanting to get to the metrics. So I'm just gonna touch on this real briefly because this will then tee up uh, what we'll talk about in terms of the metrics themselves. So of course, boards are asking themselves more questions, which means they're gonna ask management more and different types of questions. So they're um, going and digging deeper than they have in the past. They are asking about the dashboards that they're getting presented with, right? Typically, if there's been an annual sort of readout, if you will, of the firm's diversity, of the company's diversity effort, efforts, boards are now trying to dig deeper, saying they want different types of metrics. And of course, if you start to think about the disclosure aspect, that makes sense that that's going to drive even more sort of conversation about what is the board seeing. And by the way, it goes both ways. So in thinking about what metrics should be disclosed under the new rule, um, a great starting point is what does the board normally see? What does the executive committee normally see? And then uh, one thing that boards are looking at too is saying, well, wait a minute, what's getting disclosed now? So what is the company already disclosing and talking about? Since these kinds of performance metrics versus pure financial metrics tend to be in different reports, in different places. Uh, in many cases, the board may not be looking at these disclosures, may not be overseeing them the way the audit committee would oversee financial reporting. So they wanna know, well, what is it we're talking about? How does that tell our story? Are we really tracking the right kinds of metrics? And then, um, so for example, 
one thing that came up in a in a conversation we had actually just a couple days ago. Uh, well, I oh, guess guess last week um, we did a big session on ESG for uh, audit committee chairs, and as part of the conversation there, there was sort of this idea of how will also future employees look at the metrics that are being disclosed. So if it's not just flexibility, which everybody expects will be a metric and will be you know widely disclosed, and em potential employees will use that to to assess their potential employers, but what about things like training dollars spent per FTE, right? How are you going to look at those? Um, something that maybe a traditional services firm might have had, but not other types of firms. So thinking about some of these, um, and I've been, again, impressed by how seriously boards are focusing on these issues and asking questions that the, in a way that they haven't before. Uh, so I'm going to actually, I had some other things to talk about, but I know, uh, Chris folks are really eager to get to some of the frameworks that you're going to talk about. So let me pause here and I might chime in uh, with some other things as we go along. Yeah. I, well, but before I, before I flip, flip to, uh, to the next slide, I, I think the first bullet point is really super interesting that they, that the board wants to know what the management team's hearing from all the other stakeholders. So it, you know that that they're not just focused on here's what we think is important, but they're they're interested to know what other stakeholders are are asking for. Um, so how, how does how does that get communicated back? Does how does management communicate that back to the board? Yeah. So specifically, boards are asking about employee. What are employees saying, and how are employees looking at this? Um, clearly, they're hearing from investors. Uh, boards do engage with very large institutional investors uh, at times more so than they do other types of stakeholders. But boards are really asking, well, how are employees thinking about DNI? What are we assessing? How do we see this? Uh, typically, there's an executive, of course, a functional executive who will report out to the board. Uh, and what we're seeing are more ad hoc types of reports. So instead of the annual, you know, kind of update to the board, boards now saying, well, wait a second, on our agenda, let's say at the next meeting, we'd like to spend 20 minutes talking about the company's current efforts and what does our dashboard look like? And of course, as you can imagine, as soon as the board puts something on their agenda, that starts a chain reaction, if you will. Uh, but even on crowded agendas, boards are making room for this. Thanks, I, I appreciate that. Well, Stay tuned because Cheatham can continue to answer any questions um, specifically as it relates to the board. But we're going to shift now to talk a little bit more about how companies are reacting. Um, and, you know, the, the first thing, more importantly than what they report or how they disclose, is what they do. And, it, you know, it's it's, I, I don't know, I, I work with a lot of companies and they're like, well, we really want to improve our disclosures. I'm like, well, you should improve your disclosures and you're probably doing really good things now, but unless you're actually improving and continuing to improve your progress, your disclosures, more disclosures aren't going to help. So um, this is a chart. Actually, we've got a, a white paper that we can can share with y'all that uh, came from the Center for Board Matters. We've got a couple of them that might be interesting. And this just shares with you, of course, the employee life cycle. Thinking, starting with your perspective and your current employees, thinking about how do I att attract and recruit them? How do we bring them on board um, and which ones do we hire? How do we manage performance? How do we develop and retain them? And then how do we handle it actually when they are leaving and make sure that we continue to build workforce equity? <clears throat> so this is just a, this is a really nice example of an employee life cycle and the different things that happen along the way but I think most important and, and interesting to consider is, okay, well, what does that mean about how I measure things along the way? And so we, we call this, a, we, did, we stacked up these process metrics. 
So these are different metrics that you might consider measuring specifically as it relates to diversity and inclusion and your HR processes, right? So this isn't necessarily social justice, but these are, a, to me, a really good example of you can't just say that final number that says, well, 15% of our people at this level are people of color or 30% are, are um, excuse me, um, people of a, a women or, or whatever diversity metrics you're looking at. So we're suggesting that you consider different metrics all the way along the way of an employee cycle. Um, onboarding could be percent of unconscious bias training that's provided to new hires. Um, you could have that same metric in your learning section or maintaining where you re-roll it out to your entire organization. Um, examples might be number of employees participating in your employee resource group. Again, we've got that under onboarding because it's about how do you get people in active quickly and understanding what you're trying to accomplish from a cultural and belonging perspective, but also those things might fit along the way in different parts of your, of your um, entire process. So hey, our one thing, one thing that strikes me um, just because of the anal analogous conversation boards have had for years uh, about bringing in women, right? You have a large class of women that comes in and then over time you're sort of losing them in that life cycle. And uh, I know that there's been research done that when you bring somebody in who may have a different perspective, it's not always easy for them to integrate. I would expect boards to start asking more questions about these kinds of things because they haven't necessarily done that in the past. But again, if you think about broader awareness, I would imagine trying to understand how are we supporting people so that as they're going through their, their cycle, we're not losing people is going to be an important an important element. You know, what one one thing that I would consider, and and I remember, um, I, re I read some stat, and you probably you probably you probably told me this stat um, <laughs> that when you have um, more than one person of a diverse background, that they are significantly. Is that where I heard that from? <laughs> Well, on boards, at first it was, okay, get a woman in, and then everybody realized the tokenism really didn't work that great. So then it became very clear you have to have two or more women on boards to get the benefit of having that diverse perspective on the board. Which, so I would expect that would be the same on other types of diversity um, that, that would count. Okay, so... So this is our thought process on one, is to look through the entire employee life cycle, measure along the way, and then as you're looking at the progress, whether these metrics are getting better or worse, then you know where then we can change some of our strategies, where we can you know, consider doing things differently to align with as we're seeing these metrics move along the way. Um, I know, for example, on the rewards, um, very common um, to, to find that gender pay gap is happening at different places along the process. It's, it's, and, and very often actually at the hiring process is where that, that's happening in some organizations. But, Again, thinking through the entire employee life cycle and what type of metrics. So now another way to think about metrics is along the impact pathway. And um, I'm going to stop a minute to thank um, Nick Jarman, who's one of uh, our colleagues who's been jumping in here on the chat. Nick is a, a colleague that, that works with, with me on a lot of, of social justice type of um, Project. So thank you, Nick, for uh, helping on answering some of the chat questions. Um, but we work a lot on setting social impact goals, helping organizations understand what type of impact they want to create and then how they can go about doing that. And 
The important thing about this is that you focus at the right place on this impact pathway. Okay, so I'm sure that you've seen this in one way, shape, or form. The, the folks from the social return on investment world call this the uh, theory of change. You might have seen it there. Um, a lot of not-for-profits have been using this the whole time, um, you know, thinking about what change are we creating. But what we've seen is too many companies start to think about impact and they don't look along the whole chain. So I'm gonna spend just a minute on this, on this slide right here, or on the impact pathway. At, at the end of the day, what an organization, what you want to do is say, what is the change that I want to create in the world? What is the change that we are looking for? Today, as we go back to some of those initial slides that we talked about, it is about achieving systemic change. It is about narrowing the wealth gap, particularly from the racial perspective. It is about creating equity across a number of but all types of diversity, whether it's gender or race or ethnicity or any other um, your, your, your sexual preference, all of these things. The, the impact is what change we want to create. Backing up, um, it, you might look at what is the outcome for a particular group of people, right? So you say, well, we want to create racial equity or, you know, close the wealth gap. Well, that's a pretty big, pretty big impact that you want to create. But backing into outcome, you can say, okay, well, we want to close the wealth gap for people of color in Midtown Atlanta, um, that focus on that, that that work in the healthcare industry, for example. So the outcome is 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 a change for a group of people. Working backwards would be the output, which are the things that you do or the the things that you do, and the input and activity are the resources that you put towards it and the activities. So. Um, so I kind of took you left to right, but let's go right to left on this example. So your input might be something like the number of employees or the number of diverse candidates. So um, it's, it's, it might be the dollars towards something could be an input. Um, an activity might be something like, well, the percent of unconscious bias training or the number of training opportunities so these are the things that you do. The output could be something like the diversity representation, or it could be your a, an employee engagement number that comes from your surveys or something like that. X percent of our employees are more engaged. And then again, the outcome working more towards what is how is their life changing? They have a living wage, the percent of people that now have a living wage. Or to your organization, the percent of people that have, um, you have be reduced absenteeism, better productivity, things like that. And then again, the long-term impact could be something like improved lifetime earnings or a reduction in healthcare. You know, there, there are a number of different um, ways that you could do this. But what we find is so many of our clients focus on the number, on the output number. So they might focus on, you know, the number of people that we, I, 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 sometimes at EY, I, I'll, I'll call on ourselves a little bit. We do a lot of skills-based volunteering. So our input would be the hours of our super smart people that we have at EY. The activity could be that we are um, uh, providing um, uh, counseling to young people and helping them with their schoolwork. And 
but, but the, the mistake comes if you are counting your output as the number of people that we have helped. You know, we've, we helped 15 people. So then the question is, what was the change that happened about it? So my goal here is to get you thinking about how can you have metrics all along the way of the impact pathway. Okay, how when you are thinking about measuring your metrics, yes, it's okay to say here's the billion dollars that we're putting towards it. But then what are those activities? What is the output? But then most importantly, what is the outcomes that will are changing because of that? And how will that change things more broadly for the long run? And kind of bringing that so back that, to the board level, that's where boards also tend to focus. So they look much more at what is the overall uh, outcome and impact of things the company is doing. And they think about that across everything, right? Even cyber risk and things like that. So it's not just how much activity, but that's also how they think about the company's ROI of their efforts if they're ultimately making the impact that they want. Um, Chris, I'm aware that I think we're a couple minutes over, so uh, oh. we probably need to wrap up soon. Oh, I am so sorry. I thought we went till 2.45. Anything else, Luke, or, or any questions? Oh, let me do two quick things. Um, so first of all, we'll send you this white paper that gives you good perspective and thought process shifting. Oh, Chris, we um, just said we can go till 2.45. I don't know where he's pulling the extra 15 minutes out of his hat, but we, we've got it now. <laughs> Thanks, Luke. Okay. Well, I, I wanted to, um, I did want to share this slide um, um, that I, I, I love this thought process here. Okay, this thought process of shifting from and to, from shareholder capitalism to stakeholder, from, you know, listening to hearing and responding. So listening is an activity where hearing and responding is clearly much more of an outcome. So I love this comparison for, for you to think about, um, thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion as a compliance issue versus a strategic opportunity. So, you know, the really love this perspective of, to, to me, it's, it's not a pure, you know, out, output to outcomes, but as you're trying to think through, how do I shift to outcomes? Um, I, I really like this perspective. I mean, these, these are, are listed um, in the white paper. Um, I also wanted to share that um, we have a podcast that we uh, can you can get some more information from. So this is um, it's called EY Sustainability Matters. Um, we'd love to have you subscribe to our podcast. We also have the Sustainable Impact Hub, um, which has all of our thought leadership and the Center for Board Matters, which just really does fantastic research on what boards are thinking. Um, and then I, I also just wanted to, to share with you our own EY's commitment to anti-racism and some of the things, some, I'll call them the tip of the iceberg things that EY is doing um, to support um, anti-racism in the United States while we're doing the hard work internally to look through all of our processes and make sure that um, we have the right measurement in place as well to make sure that we are not inadvertently doing the wrong thing. So that is, those are the slides that we had. I'll, I'll flip back to maybe this one or this one and see if anybody has um, any questions um, or any other ideas about metrics or, or areas where they would like to see some better metrics? Chris, while folks are thinking about it, uh, one, oh, somebody's asking for page 10 and 11. All right, here's page 10. I'll leave that up for a little bit. 
So one thing that I did want to mention is in thinking about these metrics, again, looking at it from the board and their oversight perspective, uh, ERM, Enterprise Risk Management, is a big part of the board conversation. And uh, what's also interesting is they're starting to, we're seeing more questions around, okay, if lack of diversity and talent inclusion is a risk, how do we start to bring that into our ERM and represent it appropriately within ERM for, for the right conversations? I don't know that anyone's got the perfect answer right now, but it's simply to say that that is part of the conversation that's happening too, is trying to integrate DNI into the existing conversations. Uh, and when the board, one of the things that's great about working with boards is a board can get a lot of change going in a company just by asking the right questions at the right time. And it seems like boards are really focusing on that. Um, maybe if you wanna go back to the other page as well, I don't know which page you're on, page 10, oh, and 11, if you wanna go back to 11 as well, I think that's what um, Takaki, I hope I'm saying it right, forgive me if I'm not. There we go. Yeah, this, this is 10, so. So this is where you can take a screenshot of it, right? <laughs> so any other questions for us? Let me see if I'm scrolling down to the chat thing here. So I know Chris and I have had a lot of fun uh, <laughs> helping helping clients think about, oh, do you see disability being discussed at the board level? Not in the conversations that we're party to, Tara. Uh, as you can imagine, sort of the board, because it's oversight, they come in at a pretty high level. And I would imagine that a lot of this is included and incorporated into that diversity conversation. So it's not just diversity around race, uh, diversity around gender, but also broader, you know, what does diversity look like to bring in a number of perspectives? Yeah, we um, actually internally, this looks like a great question for you, um, Cheatham, but I, um, I, I did want to, to share that it, at EY, we actually have a whole approach on neurodiversity um, and have hired, um, I think, upwards towards 5,000 people that have uh, come from a, a, a they, they're somewhere on the autism spectrum. Um, and we have identified great ways so they can add value to our clients and the work that we do um, and really focusing on, on that particular disability, Tara, but um, not necessarily um, a, a, a huge variety at this point. Yeah, and a couple more questions came in. So um, let me take Bonnie's question first, and then I'll come back to Brenna's. So Bonnie, your question about the supply chain, what's fascinating is ESG, more the broader ESG conversations, they're now very much becoming part of the supply chain conversation. And because of also what's happened this year with COVID and the concept of resiliency for enterprises, boards are now asking a lot more questions about supply chain, going two or three levels deeper into supply chain, more around the robustness of it. So do we have, what do our second tier suppliers, third tier suppliers look like? But we're starting mm -hmm. to also then see the ESG conversation get embedded into supply chain, both around sustainability as well as understanding wait a minute, if we are buying, um, we have the ability to ask questions. So boards are starting to ask management, how are you thinking about supply chain in terms of ESG? Haven't heard as much about getting into DNI with supply chain, but again, this is an evolution. Mm -hmm. Different boards are at different levels. And we would expect as you know, Chris and other colleagues and those of you around the table here start to do more that boards may be um, seeing more around that. And then, well, uh, hey, Cheetah, let, let me yeah. jump in real quick there. Oh, yeah. From working yeah, yeah. with management's perspective, um, we're doing a tremendous amount of work there. And, and Bonnie specifically looking at the complexity um, and the, in the Southern Hemisphere um, and, and products coming from there. So we're seeing our more forward-looking clients 
um, absolutely doing the analysis to identify the hot spots for um, for it, it's usually not called social justice, right? O outside of the U.S., it's usually human rights. Um, so looking around child labor and slave labor and um, a, a number of other things, um, we uh, are doing a tremendous amount of work, mostly for our more leading ESG clients um, where we're doing that work. But so management is definitely thinking about it in the leading companies. So I expect that uh, the boards will start to think about it as well. Um, and that's and, where it's fun that you get the two different perspectives, right, Chris? Because we're not seeing as much from the board side. So it's yeah. good to know management is focusing on those. Um, I did want to just just um, respond to Brenna. Yeah as well before we before we wrap up here the most common pitfall Brenna, i've spent so much of my career on this i i used to actually help management teams uh with preparing for board uh board presentations before i shifted to more governance type of work the most common pitfall when you're looking at board level metrics is to get too detailed just like chris outlined there you know, giving a list of activities, boards get kind of frustrated with that because they know that management's got it and understands the activity. So it's it's the outcome and then the impact that they're looking for. I think of this much more simplistically as the what, the so what, and the now what. Boards trust that management's gonna take care of the what. They're more interested in the so what and then the now what um, in terms of the company perspective. The other thing that I will say more broadly is, um, the and this is the number one thing that we hear from boards is when they are having the conversation around this, they don't want to be looking at a bunch of slides. So making sure information is incorporated in their pre-reading so that in the room it's an actual discussion. I know that sounds really basic and I'm sure everybody does it, but it's still surprising to me how many times I hear that from boards in terms of the feedback that they're giving their management teams. Steal that, the what, the so what, and the now what. I love that. <laughs> Do I have to my, credit you? My favorite you framework. No, I think somebody else came up with that framework. It's been around oh, for a okay. while. My alma mater, CEB, we used to use that. So I think I think it's now common. What is that thing called? If it's not copyrighted, it's sort of common. Oh, common oh, law yeah, doesn't yeah. seem right, but common usage. I, I like it better. So again, don't tell anybody because EY uses um, now, next, and beyond, which I kind of like that too, but it's not as good as what, so what, <laughs> now what. So. Well, they're slightly different. For, you know, I'm I'm basically a nerd, so um, it's it's a slightly different frameworks, but I like the the you know what, so what, and now what because it sort of tees up the appropriate focus, I think, for folks. Well, we probably should wrap it up at this point. So, Chris, let me, let me hand it off to you to wrap up. Oh, and I see Kelly um, is on the moderation panel. So, Kelly, I'm guessing that that you are moderating the next uh, the next session. So, glad to see you. Kelly is a colleague. Um, and, and Phil, I'm afraid we aren't going to get to your question, but I, if, if you can try to reach out to me, I'm chris.hagler at ey.com. I can share with you some of the examples that, um, that we are starting to see as they relate to, to JEDI goals, um, which again, I love the phraseology, but I'm maybe a little geek there too. Um, but um, do feel free to, to reach out anytime. And um, thank you all very much for your questions. As you can tell, this is a, a very, um, uh, it is such a dynamic topic right now. I mean, I, I couldn't pull out my slides from three weeks ago and just use them on this, <laughs> this presentation. You know, we are constantly updating our, our thoughts, our examples. We, you know, when I have clients ask me about best practice, I'm like, there's a lot of people doing stuff. I don't know for sure what is best practice yet. Um, you know, there's there's just it is so dynamic. So one thing I can tell you is stay tuned. Um, really, please just stay tuned and and continue to ask and check back with our um, with some of our thought leadership because we will continue. We are so focused on this and helping our clients on this. So please 
uh, continue to uh, get get in touch with us and, and ask any questions.